Today, we're talking about protostomes. We are going to introduce protostomes and then talk about two major groups, the flatworms and the rotifers. All bilaterally symmetrical organisms break down into either protostomes or deuterostomes. We might remember this from the last chapter. They differ in their embryological development. With protostomes, the blastopore turns into the mouth, a solid group of cells splits from the endoderm into the mesoderm, and then the mesoderm splits internally to form the coelom. Here are some uh, examples of protostomes, worms, rotifers, mollusks like bivalves and cephalopods, arthropods like arachnids and insects are all protostomes. In fact, the majority of animals are protostomes. Here's our phylogeny of protostomes. Protostomes can be divided up into two broad categories, spiralia and ectozoa. Spiralia are aquatic animals that show spiral cleavage within the blastula. Two major groups here are platyazoa and lophotrochozoa. Platyazoa are, in general, simple worms that have no circulatory respiratory systems but do have sophisticated reproductive systems. Lophotrochozoa are free-living organisms that all have a trochophore larva that unites them. Ectosozoans are all animals that molt to grow. They grow to fill out an external skeleton and then they have to shed that skeleton in order to get bigger. So today we're going to talk about some of the platyazoans. We'll talk about platyhelminthes as well as rotifera. And then we can talk about the annelids and the mollusks, which are the major groups of lophotrochozoans. Then, towards the end of the chapter, we'll move on to talk about nematodes and arthropods, the biggest groups of ectosozoans. So starting here with phylum platyhelminthes. These, again, are simple worms, soft-bodied worms that are really the simplest bilaterally symmetric animals. However, they can have complex structures. Many species are parasitic, like tapeworms and flukes. They have simple bodies with no circulatory or respiratory systems, but they can have these complex reproductive systems. Others are free living, the tubularians. They live in a variety of habitats, marine, freshwater, and moist terrestrial habitats. The marine flatworms tend to be pretty colorful, whereas the terrestrial um, tubularians are more drab. Wherever they're located, they tend to be either carnivorous or detritivores. So looking in more detail at these two major groups of flatworms, first the free-living tubularians. These guys are triploblastic, but their bodies are solid. They are acelomate. They do have an incomplete digestive cavity, kind of like a gastrovascular cavity, that has only one opening at the bottom of the organism. They have a muscular pharynx that protrudes from this opening that can work to tear up food. Tubularians have no circulatory system. They rely instead on diffusion to transport gases. They also have very simple excretory and nervous systems. They have flame cells, which are bulb-like structures with flagella that move water and waste through tubules and out the body through pores. Towards the anterior end of the organism, we have concentrated nervous structures and tissues. Eye spots, which are light sensitive. Tubularians tend to prefer the dark. Auricles are structures that jut out from the anterior end. They sense vibration and can also contain chemosensory cells. And finally, flatworms have nerve cords and ganglia. Here we see a more freshwater flatworm, a little more um, drab in appearance. And then we have these marine flatworms down here. 
Flatworms reproduce sexually. Most are hermaphroditic, though copulation is required. They rely on internal fertilization of each other. They also have a tremendous capacity for asexual regeneration, which we'll take a look at here. So that's only five days after regeneration has started, but you can see that there's already a distinct anterior end of the organism and eye spots there too. So pretty crazy capacity for regeneration. This diagram from your book shows some of the major structures of a flatworm, tubularian flatworm. We got the anterior end here with the eye spots. We have that pharynx that protrudes out of that single um, opening to the digestive cavity. You can see through cross section that the organism does have three germ layers. It is triploblastic, but it is also acelomate. So no internal body cavity except for that digestive tract. These diagrams show some of the structures that a tubularian has internally. The excretory system is flame cells, so all these little bulges here are flame cells. Here's our nervous system, very simple, right? Just ganglia here concentrated at the anterior end, and then two tracts of uh, new nerve cords that extend down the organism, kind of like a ladder. And then, oops, here, reproductive system, we've got both ovaries and testes in every organism. They are hermaphroditic, though they still rely on copulation with each other. The other major group of flatworms is the parasites, the flukes and the tapeworms. These are both highly effective parasites, but they are structured differently. Tapeworms lack digestive systems completely. They absorb food directly through body walls, whereas flukes or trematodes attach within the host body by suckers, anchors, or hooks, and then take in cells or fluid through the mouth. Flukes have very complex life cycles that have usually two or more hosts. If there's just one host, it's most likely a fish. If there are two hosts, usually it's a snail and then some kind of vertebrate where sexual reproduction occurs. For a long time, parasitic worms were just thought to cause these um, negative health effects directly to the organism host organism, but with more research, we now know that there's a whole host of effects 
that these guys can have on the host. Not just changing the physiology, but the behavior of the host organism to make infection more likely. So to take a, a look at that, we got a clip of zombie snails here. Right. So this is a parasite called leucochloridium. The egg is eaten by the snail, which then absorbs the nutrients that the snail takes in. It also chemically castrates the snail, so the snail spends less energy on itself and its reproduction. The larvae invade the eye stalks and dance around, making the snail more conspicuous. The larva also makes the snail diurnal, meaning that it's active during the day as opposed to nocturnal, active during the night, which is the more common behavior of a snail. The eyes are then eaten by birds since they are so conspicuous. I guess it uh, might be a, a mercy that the snail usually lives through this and goes on to, to live its life eyeless. All told about 12 para, uh, worm parasites, flatworm parasites occur in humans. And some of those are tapeworms. Right? Tapeworms are endoparasites. These guys um, have a scolex, which is four suckers and hooks um, at the terminal end of the organism that is used to hang on to the inner wall of the host's intestine. This is not a head. There's no concentrated nervous tissue here or a mouth. This is followed by a series of proglottids, which uh, make up the majority of the tapeworm. They form continuously throughout the worm's life. Each proglottid is a complete herma hermaphroditic unit, meaning that it contains both male and female organs. As proglottids are formed, they migrate towards the end of the organism, uh, they mature, they are fertilized, mostly relying on cross-fertilization, and then embryos detach and are uh, lost to the environment to, hopefully for them, infect another organism. So here we can see those structures, right? Scolex, and then a long series of proglottids, each with a complete set of reproductive parts. Good example here is the beef tapeworm or Tania saginata. This is a frequent human endoparasite that is uh, found due to poor sanitation um, in uninspected rare beef. It lives as a juvenile in cow muscle, and then when that beef is eaten rare, it can infect a human, grow up to 10 meters long or higher, continuously shedding proglottids through the feces. These eggs, uh, the eggs contained within the proglottids, are viable for five months or so. As they land on grass, they can be eaten by other cows, and the cycle continues. Flukes cause a variety of serious diseases in humans. One of the most important threats to human health are the blood flukes, or schistosoma. These afflict about 5% of the world's population, second only to malaria as far as a parasite is concerned. This works out to 200 million people or a year, about 200,000 of which die, mostly in the tropics in the Middle East. The um, blood fluke causes schistosomiasis, which can lead to organ damage and chronic symptoms like fatigue. It can also lead to developmental delays in children. Here, um, the fertilized egg has to break through the wall of the blood vessel to get out into other parts of the body, like the intestines and the bladder. Uh, about 300 to 3,000 eggs are laid every day. And these guys can live for decades, which means that damage can really add up over time. Another good example is the oriental liver fluke, 
which is caused by uh, or contracted by eating fish, and this causes liver damage like cirrhosis and um